can't see much to paint on the inside. Or can you work in the rain? Not very well. It may not look it, but this old house was once the finest in all of Kent. I know because I lived here for many years. Those walls are constructed of the finest hardwood. The veneer was at one time deep as pure glass. And this, this hand of stone is a symbolism which has surely had a most devastating effect upon the estate and all its occupants since the very beginning. The builder had for some reason placed these hands in every single room of the house as well as outside of it. The grounds themselves which boundary the place were marked significantly at various points all along the property line. It was almost as if an unseen wall had been in mind to stretch the distance between the backwoods and the turbulent sea with all its restless motion. Near the house itself, there was not one area that had been overlooked in the placement of that which was to bring about terror to each succeeding generation. I'm certain that the hands were laid down to bring about a curse, a violent curse upon each and every owner of the house. The first of these was Robert Braun, who together with his beautiful wife had purchased a place on their wedding day. This before their lives were to be changed considerably. upon Robert Braun manifested quite suddenly in the form of a letter being delivered by courier. This letter was to inform Mr. Braun of his complete financial insolvency. Darling, I have to pick up Clifford and go to the city. Oh, I knew it was something wrong. You'll probably stay the night. Oh. I'll get back. We'll see. Wouldn't it help to tell me? No. All right. I know it has something to do with finances. I want you to take along my house money. It isn't much.
What are you going to do? Get me that money. With a little help. Who can help you with such an amount? In the city. The club you belong to, where they have gambling. I want you to take me there. Tonight? Yes. <laughs> I salute. Your friend isn't known here. I'm sponsoring Mr. Brown. You've discussed the rules with him? I have. House bets. No more bets, please. One black. We don't care. I know. Well, I can't wait. However, gentlemen. No more bets, please. Black the loser. This club is perpetuated to assist those individuals who have met with extreme financial handicap. A policy of insurance covering the life of each member is effected upon their first entrance. The club, being made beneficiary of the policy, can extend credit for gambling up to and not exceeding the amount of insurance. 
If this sum is lost to the club, the individual is then required to participate in the drawing of cards to see if he will meet execution in order that the club may collect upon his policy. As the club's existence is dependent upon collections, it requires that two men be executed each time a new member has joined in. This ruling provides the balance and foundation upon which the club stands. The two men who draw the Queen of Hearts are eliminated by two others, the executioners, who draw aces. Those drawing aces must carry out their executions within three days' time, by any means they wish. An individual called for execution may be reprieved only by the payment in full of his indebtedness to the club. So I'm afraid, Mr. Braun, you'll have to pay us by one of the two methods. You must know that a man at this point still retains an excellent chance to beat the odds involved in the drawing. Some have survived a long time, including your friend Clifford. In any event, this is the card of death. If you draw this card, you're out of the game quite permanently. Tomorrow night, 9 o'clock promptly. Be here with the amount you owe us, sir. Continue to gamble. My stock paper, the portfolio. I want the amount. Yes, sir. Zero, sir. It's empty. Oh, Mr. Brown's account empty. My sympathy.
I'd like to introduce our newest member, a dear friend of mine for many, many years, Mr. Robert Braun. Mr. Braun, yes, it's a pleasure to meet you, Mr. Braun. Drink. Braun. To you. Gentlemen,
aces for executioners. Robert Brown wrestled throughout most of the night with the one idea of contacting the police and ending the nightmare once and for all time. In considering all possible consequences in going to the police with the entire story, he decided to attempt to turn his own fate into a direction for the better. The least that could be done would be to think things out in a clear manner. A much needed perspective was the primary goal. And a day's relaxation in the proper environment could possibly do wonders in bringing about the channels of thought that were desperately needed if Robert Braun were to find the idea that would ultimately set him free. It was not until fate manifested itself in the form of a gypsy woman that the hand was forced to play the one card that could remotely bring about a solution. The woman begged for the opportunity to read their fortune an occurrence not at all uncommon to country gentlemen and their wives. But for Robert Braun, this was the very thing he for that day wanted to avoid. As the woman delved into her plane of the unknown power, she confided exuberantly of the great store of happiness that would be continuously filling the long life of Mrs. Braun. Accepting one particular period of intense grief, hers would be a life of particular joy. Now it was confirmed. The course of action had made itself plain. Robert Braun knew what he had to do. This way. I 
I hope you've discovered whatever it is you're looking for. You wish to see me? What is your name, please? Don't be afraid to tell me your name. Robert Brown. I can't go sneaking to my own home. I know. It's clear. You'll be all right now. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
The house lied empty and still for the rest of that summer and throughout the cold winter that followed. The estate was duly purchased in the spring by my sister and her husband, who with their three children and myself found it to be an ideal home where everyone could find his own element of contentment. My sister and brother-in-law were gentle people, and since moving into the house, had been completely unaware of the differences that were beginning to exist between their three children. The two youngest were cheerfully robust and busy themselves playing the happy games of childhood, much the same as any other. But the oldest boy, Charles, would not often mix in the pastimes of those his own age. Charles was taken to spend most of his time alone. He was morosely attracted to the symbolic hand. He idolized it, and the effect of its spell would take on an evil aura for the remainder of his life. Charles spent weeks at the side of his sister, but it was not remorse that he felt. Inside, he was actually glad because he now dominated her, the same as he did Jamie, their brother. With the passing years, the children Charles, Jamie, and Beth grew up, and both parents were one day lost at sea in a boating excursion, with their bodies never being found. I was the only survivor of the older generation as Charles became master of the house. And now it had changed completely. Charles ruled the estate with unquestioned authority. What he desired became his. If he wanted music, it was played. As for his sister Beth, she had learned many years before of the consequences in questioning Charles' actions. In the village, Charles would show a great reserve and proper dignity. I was always intrigued by his clever performance and watched him closely. I tell you, Oli, the years around here were a lot different before he became master. I can remember when it was a pleasure, a real pleasure, to keep these grounds up. It makes me sick at my stomach, the way young Jamie and his sister have to take orders. You'd think this place was a prison. Why don't you just do your job and mind your business? Seems to me it'd be a lot easier. I mean to protect my business by knowing what's going on. Young Jamie will be off to university tomorrow. Gone till Christmas. You probably haven't been around here long enough to know what that means. You can expect Charles to be at his very worst until the semester's over. He'll begin to miss Jamie after a few weeks, and the situation for all of us will become more and more miserable as the time goes on. He'll start to rant like a madman. You'll see right up until December. I wish I could say it was December now. But with Jamie out of college and his wedding to that girl Ruth all done, we might find a little cheerfulness around here.
Jamie. <laughs> I'm putting the coach ticket inside your suitcase. Don't lose it. Hey, I'm leaving tomorrow, remember? No. Why, fiance, you are. What are you looking for? I thought I saw a shell. <laughs> it's all right, though. I don't want it. Wait a minute. Ruth? to our house. It'll give you three long months to get yourself settled before Jamie gets back for the wedding. Thank Charles. He actually suggested it. And thus it had begun. Like the surging force of a storm-ridden sea, this black power that Charles possessed had to be executed fully on anyone and everyone that would touch upon his own small world. Anybody home? Hello?
Jamie. <laughs> My wife, Jane. Wife? My wife! Jamie! <laughs> My boy. Well, I think you should start setting up for the party. Jamie's honor. You must understand. Women have been surely the cause of every problem that men have known. This one was no different. She threw herself at me. I felt I should help her. She wasn't for you, Jamie. Your marriage will come. That's what I still hope for. When? That's right. I know. I'm sorry. You better take some water over to the south side. There's not one bud in that whole section. Do you know I've been filling up and carrying this pail since 7 o'clock this morning? Both the back gardens are so dry, we're likely to lose about everything. I think we might get a little rain soon. Pretty silly, isn't it? What silly? Well, now, what do you think? It's downright rotten to ask a man to carry this water 70 yards in two directions when there's a perfectly good well on the south side just going to waste. I asked him about it again last week. I'm afraid the answer was just the same as before. What goes on in his crazy head, anyway? He got hidden over there that we shouldn't see. I thought you believed in minding your own business. You're always telling me that. Yes, yes, I know. But a body's natural curiosity about the place where he works is one thing. The way you go about it is something else again. Well, let's forget the whole thing. Well, no. No, 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 this is one time. I I'd like to know what you've got to say. What about that well? You're always accusing me of being over-curious and carrying stories. Well, there are times I think you go a bit too far. Even so, I, I think you really know something this time. Now, what about the well? Ole, I've been around here a long time. I've seen things that no one else has. Well, come on. Let's hear it. <laughs> the facts are pretty obvious. It isn't the well that's out of bounds. It's something close to it. Now, you figure out what that might be. Well, there's nothing close to it at all, except the wall of the house. And that outside entrance to the wine cellar. An entrance that's been nicely boarded up for over five years. Ole, have you ever had an occasion to go into the cellar since you've been here? No, I, I've had orders to go in most parts of the house, but never down to the cellar. Not even to sweep. Who does clean up down there? None of us are permitted to enter the cellar for any purpose at all. With all these crazy restrictions around here, I never really thought about it. Have you ever been down there? Several times. I have my own ways of doing just about everything. But what's in it? What did you find? A lot of things. Shells, barrels, a good stock of wine, and a locked room. A room? What sort of room? I'm afraid I can't answer that just at the moment. You see, I haven't had sufficient opportunity to find out very much about it. I promise you, though, the moment I do, you'll be the first to know.
I brought in some fine new stock only two days ago. What's in there? Nothing. See if Ruth's going. Ruth? We're leaving for town. How many are going? Myself and Charles. Oh, did Beth leave already? Mm, we're picking her up. I won't go then. I'll see you for lunch. Not coming? I guess not. You have a headache again? No. She'll see you at night. No. Come on, let's be gone. I don't want to be harsh with Jamie, but it seems Ruth has been acting strangely ever since he returned. Aha! in that room? I don't know. Look.
Bet you're still slow. <laughs> I love you. I know that. Good health. And your sister Connie's. Thanks. Connie's improved so much lately you wouldn't know her. Well, these months without him coming have been a godsend. I just pray it stays that way. You can't really tell about it. 
He may be through with Connie and he may not. I wouldn't count on anything 100%. Not after what I saw last night. Well, what's your latest? Marriage hasn't a chance to last much longer. Ruth and Jamie will be making plans, I'd say, by the end of the month, perhaps sooner. Mm, they're serious about it? No question. I saw with my own eyes the whole situation come into focus last night. Charles has a power, all right. Hypnotism or whatever you will. But it hasn't the degree of penetration with some people that it has with others. I've known for a long time Ruth was capable of breaking it off. Mm, I wish I could say the same for Connie. Oh, how I wish it. I'd better go upstairs and see if she's needing something. I don't know whether I should be glad about what you just told me or not. Maybe I'm too selfish. Please, I have something to tell you. Something important. Uncle Bruce, Ruth. Ruth? Somewhere with Jamie. And Charles? He just came in. He'll kill her.
doing? What are you doing here? 